Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last lecture we have been reviewing several of the properties of matrices, special matrices, operations on matrices. We are going to continue the coverage of uh, other properties of matrices that are critical to our analysis. The first of the topic in that direction are going to be the notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of any real matrix. Let A be a n by n real matrix. If there exists a vector V belonging to R n at a constant lambda a real or a complex constant R such that A V is equal to lambda V then lambda is called the eigenvalue and V is called the eigenvector of A. From the definition it follows that lambda v the pair the constant lambda and the vector v is the solution of the homogeneous system that can be obtained from a v is equal to lambda v. For v to be a non if v is 0 this equation is trivially satisfied v is equal to 0 is called the trivial solution we are seeking non trivial vector that means a non zero vector for a non zero vector to solve this equation it is necessary that the determinant of the matrix a minus lambda i must be 0. We have earlier seen one of the conditions necessary for the existence of solution of homogeneous system is the system must be singular here the system matrix is a minus lambda i um, the, the determinant of a minus lambda i must be 0 the determinant of lambda a minus lambda i elements of A are known elements of I are known lambda is a variable. So, it becomes a polynomial of degree n this polynomial P lambda which is the determinant of A minus lambda I is called the characteristic polynomial. An nth degree polynomial has n roots let lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n be the n roots of P lambda is equal to 0 from fundamental theorem of arithmetic we all know that lambdas can be either real or complex. Complex roots always come in conjugate pairs. The reason complex root come in conjugate pairs is that the elements of the matrix A are real. This implies the coefficients of the polynomial P lambda are real and when you are trying to solve a polynomial with real coefficients the roots if it is complex it has to be complex conjugate that is for any general matrix. For a special class of matrices when A is symmetric lambdas are real when A is symmetric and positive definite positive symmetric and positive definite matrices are called SPD S for symmetry PD for positive definite definiteness lambdas are real and positive. This means that for a general matrix the for a general matrix the eigenvalues lie in a complex plane this is the real axis this is the imaginary axis. So, for a general matrix the eigenvalue can be anywhere if it is complex it might occur in conjugate pairs it could be real it could be positive it could be here. So, that is a general distribution of eigenvalue for any general matrix for symmetric matrices the eigenvalues are always real the eigenvalues are real this is for symmetric matrix for a positive definite matrix the eigenvalues are always real and positive. So, you can see the restriction uh, how it constrains the distribution of eigenvalues it could be anywhere in the two dimensional complex plane for a general matrix it is along the real line for symmetric matrices it is in the positive half of the real line for symmetric positive definite matrices we will have lot more occasions to talk about symmetric positive definite matrices. So, this eigen structure of symmetric positive definite matrices is, is an important property that we need to keep in mind. We are going to illustrate the 
computations of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that A be a symmetric matrix by the previous claim the eigenvalues must be real yes 9 and 4 they are real but by solving by solving the equation A v is equal to lambda v A v 1 lambda 1 v 1 A v 2 equal to lambda 2 v 2 these are two equations corresponding to two distinct eigenvalues. If you solve these um, linear equations it can be found that v 1 is, is uh, 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 one eigenvector v 2 is another eigenvector. The eigenvector we are interested only in the direction of the eigenvectors. So, we normalize it. So, v 1 is a normalized eigenvector v 2 is a normalized eigenvector. It can be shown v 1 is this is not right it is a perpendicular sign v 1 and v 2 are orthogonal v 1 v and 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 v 2 v 1 orthogonal to v 2 orthogonal to v 2. So, um, I, I would very much encourage um, um, the reader to be able to verify these computations. Now, I am going to generalize this let a be a symmetric positive definite matrix let lambda i v i be such that a v i is equal to lambda i v i for each i running from 1 to n there are n such equations. So, we have a collection of vectors eigen vectors without loss of generality as we mentioned eigen vectors are going to be normalized. So, v 1 v 2 v n is a collection of mutually orthogonal and normalized eigen vectors. So, it constitutes an orthonormal system we have already seen the notion of orthonormality in the last class. Now, I am going to con, uh, construct a matrix V which consists of n columns the first column is the first eigenvector second column is second eigenvector nth column is the nth eigenvector. This is a matrix there is a correction here this is the matrix is n by n. Uh, this matrix is orthogonal. So, its transpose is equal to inverse. Uh, so, from the basic definition a v is equal to v lambda uh, 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 this essentially tells you simultaneously all the equations that are summarized one for each i. So, this equation a v is equal to v lambda where lambda is a diagonal matrix. So, you can readily see a is the given matrix v is the matrix of n eigenvectors lambda is a diagonal matrix of n corresponding n eigenvalues. Look at the order lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n v 1 v 2 v n they are correspondence with each other. Since v transpose is equal to v inverse I can multiply on the right side by v transpose. So, a v equal to v lambda so, we can multiply a v v transpose is equal to v lambda v transpose, but v v transpose is equal to a uh, is equal to i v v transpose is equal to i identity matrix. So, a is equal to v lambda v transpose this is called the Eigen decomposition of a this Eigen decomposition of a can be expressed in in element form. So, this is simply the sum of the product outer products of v i and v i transpose. So, v i v i transpose is a matrix each of these matrices are weighted by lambda i. So, a can be expressed as the weighted sum of rank 1 matrices each rank 1 matrix corresponds to a, an eigenvector. The now we come to another important concept associated with this called spectral radius denoted by rho of a spectral radius is equal to the maximum of the absolute value of the lambdas. So, if a is a symmetric matrix lambdas are real if a is a symmetric and positive definite lambdas are, uh, are real and positive. So, the the spectral radius of a symmetric matrix is given by the maximum of the absolute value of eigenvalues. Now, we are going to introduce another related concept called singular values of a let a be a non singular matrix 
the Gramian A transpose A and A A transpose are then symmetric positive definite. In fact, there is a result here I would like you to think about the Gramian must be capital G because it is the name of the person capital G. So, A is non singular A transpose A and A A transpose are symmetric matrix if A is non singular it is said to be full rank if A is non singular and full rank then A A transpose A transpose A are both symmetric and positive definite this is a very fundamental result with respect to with respect to the um, um, uh, symmetric positive definite matrices and its relation to Gramian. So, if A is um, non singular A transpose A is um, symmetric therefore, I can do a symmetric decomp um, eigenvalue analysis A transpose A V i is equal to lambda i V i this is the same as we have done for A now what we did for A I am redoing for A transpose A here lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n are the eigenvalues because A transpose A is positive the even the least eigenvalue is positive we are going to order the eigenvalues the largest is called lambda 1 the next largest is called lambda 2 the least largest is called lambda n in the least largest is also positive that means everybody else is positive. Now, I would like to relate the eigenvalues eigenvectors of A. So, given a matrix A there are 2 Gramians A transpose A, A A transpose both are symmetric and positive definite. I am now going to argue if you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of one of the Gramians we also can infer the eigenvalue and eigenvectors of the other Gramian. To that end I am giving it a homework problem to verify it is it's, it's very simple A transpose A times U i is equal to lambda i U i where U i is defined by 1 over square root of lambda i A V i. So, if you for if I know A I know A transpose A if I know A transpose A I know lambda i V i. So, I know A I know V i I know lambda i. So, using A V and lambda you define a new vector U i. So, new vector U i is simply a linear transformation of the vector V i scaled by 1 over square root of the eigenvalue. So, this the if I define U i this way it can be verified that A transpose uh, A A transpose U i is equal to lambda i U i. So, this essentially tells you lambda i is simultaneously eigenvalue of A A transpose as well as A transpose A they, they both share the same eigenvalue. The eigenvectors V i and U i are related by this. So, here is a summary A transpose A and A A transpose share the same eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are also related you can essentially see U i is related to V i. Now, if I define sigma i to be square root of lambda i now please rec remember lambda i's are the eigenvalues of the symmetric positive different matrix they are all positive. So, square root of that exists and square root of that is real. So, I am now going to define the positive square root of lambda i equal to sigma i and the sig. So, for each lambda i there is a sigma i there are n such sigma i's sigma i's by definition they are called singular values of a. So, the eigenvalues of a transpose a are called this uh, um, 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 the, eigen, the square root of the eigenvalues of A transpose A are called the singular values of A. So, singular value decomposition, singular values, eigenvalues, eigen decomposition these are all the related concepts that we are seeing in this part of the talk. Now, we move on to another uh, interesting concept relating to matrices just like vectors have a size just like the size of a vector is captured by the notion of a norm of a vector matrix is also an object every object can be endowed with a definition of its size. The size of a vector is measured by the norm of a vector the size of a matrix is also going to be uh, defined by a norm of a matrix. So, I am now going to define the notion of what is called norm of a matrix A it is the measure of the size of A. Just like in the vector case we had various norms 2 norm, 1 norm, infinity norm, Minkowski's norm, energy norm. In the case of matrices also we have quite a variety of norms to talk about. I am not going to talk about all the possible norms I am going to talk about some of the simple norms 
which are often used in analysis. The first of the norms is called the Frobenius norm. Frobenius norm of A is simply an extension of the Euclidean norm for the matrix A. The Frobenius norm is denoted by this symbol the norm sign with the subscript F and what is it? You take the sum of the squares of all the all the elements of the matrix take the square root of it. This is exactly the way we had defined the Euclidean norm. The Euclidean norm of a vector is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares. Here it is the square root of the sum of the squares of all the n square elements in the matrix and that is one measure of the size of the norm. There is another uh, norm called induced norm. These induced norm um, are defined using the notion of an operator. So, let A be a matrix that corresponds to a linear operator or a linear transformation. The pth norm of A defined by the norm symbol A with a subscript P that is defined by the supremum taken over all x that is not 0 of the ratio a x p norm divided by x p norm. So, you can essentially see the following given a given a pick any arbitrary vector x a x is a vector computes its p norm x has also its p norm compute this ratio this ratio varies a is fixed x varies you vary x x belongs to r of n there are infinitely many x's as you vary x this ratio varies as this ratio varies I am interested in the maximum value. So, supremum is a you can think of suprema is, is a very technical term I do not want to get into the technicality for practical purposes you can assume it is a maximum value of the ratio of the p norm of a x to the p norm of x. So, what does this tell you? This tells you the following a two dimensional analogy is like this here is the vector x here is the vector a f x the a f x has so the numerator tells you the p th norm of a f x the denominator tells you the, the p th norm of x if this ratio is larger than 1 a x is, 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 is larger than x that means there is a magnification if this a x um, if the numerator is less than the denominator then there is a shrink. So, a linear operator can either elongate a vector or a shrink a vector the maximum of this ratio the magnification factor is called the 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 pth norm of 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 the operator a or a linear transformation a equivalently we can also compute the the pth norm of f x where x is constrained by this relation in other words you can consider all those vac vectors x whose pth norm is 1. So, you reduce the 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 range of values of n which is which is which is equivalent to this definition. So, this is how you define the pth norm of 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 a matrix by setting p is equal to by setting I it should be uh, uh, lower case p by setting p is equal to 1 to infinity we get various matrix norm you can get 1 norm 2 norm infinity norm and so on. Uh, given the ma uh, matrix now that we have a matrix norm we have a vector norm there are standard inequalities which are of great interest in proving several results in analysis. So, the norm of a transformed vector. So, x is a vector a x is another vector a x is a transformation of x by a. So, what does the left hand side say in the inequality 1 the norm of the transformed vector is less than or equal to the product of the norm of the operator a and the norm of the vector x. Likewise the norm of the product of two matrices a and b is less than the product of the norm of the operator a and the operator b these are two fundamental inequalities. Now, please realize in this inequality I had not I did not specify the nature of the norm this inequality is true for any and every type of norm you can pick a two norm one norm infinity norm or any other norm for all of these norms these inequalities hold good these are fundamental inequalities and these inequalities are very similar to several of the inequalities we have seen for the vectors. 
Now, we have defined the norm, but the whole question is how do I compute these p norms? How do you compute? In other words, how do I compute these various norms for matrices? Here is uh, um, um, an, an, an example of the computation. If A is the matrix, the one norm of A, it can be proven that it is equal to the maximum over J of summation i is equal to 1 to 1 a i j. So, let us let us talk about this now. I have a matrix A. I have a matrix A. A has different columns. So, let us consider the jth column of A. The elements of the jth column are going to be a 1 j, a 2 j and a n j. So, what is that we are now going to be looking for? We are going to be looking for the absolute value of each of these and I am going to take this sum of the absolute value this must be absolute value sum of the absolute value of the elements uh, uh, and, and the, take the maximum over j. So, one is called the column norm another is called the row norm. So, the maximum is taken over j for the column norm because j is the column index um, i is the row index. So, now look at this now. So, for one you sum along the row for another one you sum along the column. So, one is called the 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 the, the first one the one norm is is the called the column norm the infinity norm is called the row norm. It can be shown that one norm can be easily computed by this infinity norm can be in p easily computed by this. These are computational algorithms for quantifying the values of these norms. The two norm of a matrix is 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 very is, is can be simply stated as sigma 1 where sigma 1 square is the is the maximum eigenvalue this must be the maximum eigenvalue. The maximum eigenvalue of A transpose A sigma 1 is also called the largest singular value we simply introduce the notion of a singular the singular value in the in the in, in the last couple of slides. So, given A you compute A transpose A, A transpose A is symmetric and positive definite if A is uh, uh, is is non singular it is symmetric and positive definite. So, all the eigenvalues are, 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 are real and positive the square root of these eigenvalues are called the singular values the maximum of those singular values is called the two norm of is not is called the two norm of A. When A is symmetric a transpose is A. So, A transpose A is A square. A square x is equal to lambda square x if A is equal to lambda x. Why is that? A square x is equal to A times A of x. This is A times uh, lambda of x. This is equal to lambda times A of x. That is equal to lambda times lambda of x. That is equal to lambda square of x. Therefore, if lambda is an eigenvalue of a lambda square is an eigenvalue of a square. If lambda uh, is an eigenvalue of a lambda to the power k is the eigenvalue of a to the power k. So, that is how the eigenvalue square itself when you square the matrices. Therefore, by combining 3 and 4 we can see the 2 norm of a is simply the maximum of the eigenvalue. I do not have to even put the um, absolute value sign because uh, a transpose A is positive symmetric and positive definite. So, sigma 1 is always positive, but for safety sake one can introduce without loss of generality and lambda x is the maximum eigenvalue. And we can also recall that the maximum eigenvalue is called the spectral radius. Therefore, we can conclude the two norm of a symmetric positive definite matrix of a symmetric positive definite matrix is given by the spectral radius. Spectral radius. So, what is it what a spectral radius means? If you consider a circle with center or origin and and diameter as 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 uh, I'm sorry that the 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 radius as rho of a, all the eigenvalues of the matrix A lie within that circle. So that's the notion of the spectral radius of 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 this matrix A. So we talked about matrices their um, uh, norms we have studied various properties of norms we these are the computational procedures for computing the values of different norms of interest in analysis. Just like we had talked about equivalence between the one norm two norm infinity norm for vectors here also I have 
a set of inequalities that relate to the behavior of various norms. So, you can show given a matrix A the 2 norm is less than or equal to the product of the square root of the product of 1 norm and infinity norm. The infinity norm and the 2 norm I can sandwich the 2 norm using the infinity norm. I can sandwich the 2 norm by 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 1 norm. I can sandwich the Frobenius norm by 2 norm. We also know that is another result which is of fundamental importance the spectral radius is less than I am sorry the spectral radius the, the, the spectral radius I, I, I want to highlight this the spectral radius of a matrix is less than any matrix norm equality happens when the matrix is, sim, is, is, is symmetric. So, these are some of the interrelations between the 2 norm, the 1 norm, the infinity norm, the Frobenius norm of 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 of, of uh, matrices in the case of mat in, in the case of matrices the eigenvalues play a definitive role in the definition of norms especially the, for the two norm and uh, this is a very nice summary of the various properties of norms of matrices why do we do norms for two reasons one is to be able to measure the size of the norm secondly the notion of a 2 norm is very useful in trying to quantify certain properties of matrices. We say a matrix is singular, we say a matrix is non singular, we say a matrix is well conditioned, we say a matrix is ill conditioned. One of the conditions for the solution of Ax is equal to b we all know if I want to be able to solve Ax is equal to b we would like to be able to make sure A is non singular. We also know when A, so we have singular and non singular yes or no day and night, but in practice some matrices may be very close to being singular without being singular. So, such matrices are said to be ill conditioned. So, I need to be able to characterize the degree of non singularity. How do you measure the degree of non singularity? One way to be able to measure the degree of non singularity is through the notion of what is called a condition number of a matrix. So, let A be n by n matrix this is the definition the condition number of a matrix is denoted by the symbol kappa of A the condition number is dependent on the definition of a norm. So, this is the condition number using p norm of a matrix the condition number of a p norm of a matrix is simply the product of the p norm of A times the p norm of A inverse. Therefore, you can see the definition of the condition number is norm dependent. So, I can have norm 1 conditioning, norm 2 conditioning, norm infinity conditioning so on and so forth. This in general if you cannot solve the equation A x is equal to b we throw the word oh the, the matrix is ill conditioned. So, if something is ill conditioned then there must be a concept of well conditioned. If something is singular, non singular very nearly singular these are all fuzzy characterizations of properties of matrices. We would like to be able to quantify this fuzziness using certain measure of the properties of these matrices that is where the condition number comes into play. How the condition number is related to uh, the, 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 the well conditioning ill condition of the matrices that is what we are going to be uh, talking about presently. Recall the standard identity i is equal to a 8 inverse. The p norm of i is, is 1 for every p 1 to infinity. So, by th but we know so if i is equal to a a inverse if I took the norm of i the norm of i it must be less than or equal to norm of a times norm of a inverse this is the inequality that we saw in a couple of three, sli uh, three slides. But the norm of identity matrix is 1 therefore, I get this inequality 1 is less than the product of the p norm of a p and a p inverse. By this definition the product of a p a p inverse is the condition number. 
So, you can readily see the condition number of A is always greater than or equal to 1 is always greater than or equal to 1. So, condition number is greater than or equal to 1 condition number is a positive number it can be very large. So, the range of the values of the condition number is 1 to infinity. So, in this scale when the condition number is closer to 1 we say it is well conditioned when the condition number is very large is ill conditioned again how large is large we will, we will talk about that in, in a minute. How large is large depends on the computer machine position in a 30 to bit arithmetic the, that is only a largest value you can measure. Therefore, if a condition number kappa of a matrix let us say is 10 to the power of 20 or 10 to the power of 50 a matrix with 10 to the power of 50 is said to be more ill conditioned than a matrix with 10 to the power of 20 which is more ill conditioned than a matrix with 10 with 10 to the power of 3. So, this ranking of the con of, of, of the condition number helps you to in some sense quantify the degree of ill condition associated with the matrix. So, now let us you I, I used the p norm I am now going to specialize the discussion of the norm for a spectral condition number. So, let A be a symmetric matrix spectral condition number is related to the maximum eigenvalue. We also know the following if lambda is an eigenvalue of A lambda inverse is an eigenvalue of A inverse. Therefore, the 2 norm of A is the maximum eigenvalue of A the 2 norm of A inverse is the minimum eigenvalue of A. So, condition number for symmetric matrices is simply given by the ratio of the maximum eigenvalue to the minimum eigenvalues. Therefore, the spectral condition number so for a symmetric matrix like this for a general non symmetric but non singular matrices the condition number is simply given by sigma 1 by sigma 2 where sigma 1 is the largest uh, uh, I am sorry this must be sigma n sorry this must be sigma n this is the ratio of the largest to the smallest uh, 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 singular values where sigma i is the ith singular value and sigma the singular values are, are, are counted like sigma 1 is greater than or equal to sigma 2 greater than or equal to sigma n and sigma n is positive. Therefore, this slide provides you a new concept of associating a number with a matrix called the condition number. The value of the condition number is very indicative of the difficulties that one will have in computational process. Before going further I also want to be able to relate the various properties of condition numbers. Again matrices are related I, 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 the, 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 uh, the eigenvalues of the matrices the singular values are related the norms are related the, uh, so there is a relation between all the condition numbers themselves because condition numbers are defined in terms of norms. If norms are related if condition numbers are related to norms condition numbers also must hold certain relations among themselves. So, the 2 condition number 1 condition number infinity condition number and 2 condition number infinity condition number and 1 condition number you can see they are all interposed. So, what does this mean if a matrix is well conditioned in one norm it is well conditioned in every norm if a matrix is ill conditioned in one norm it is ill conditioned in every norm. So, what does this tell you? You can pick any norm that suits you computationally and do the analysis without having to worry about the choice of the norms. So, that gives you provides that provides you a lot of freedom, but among all the norms the one norm and the infinity norm are easy, easily computed one is the column norm another is the row norm. Therefore, from a computational perspective one may want to be able to use one norm or infinity norm, but in mathematical analysis theoretical analysis they generally often use the 2 condition number 2 norm because 2 condition number 2 norm is intimately associated with the Eigen structure spectral radius and, and so on that is that is that is a very appealing very appealing uh, 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 property. In the first course in linear algebra we are generally told the ill condition of the matrix is decided by the value of the determinant 
but I am going to give you a counter example to show it is not the case. In other words what we are told in a first course in linear algebra if I have difficulty in solving a x is equal to b if I am difficult if I have if I have difficulty in solving a x is equal to b if the determinant of a is very large or very small then they will simply tell that the, you will have numerical difficulty yes you may have numerical difficulty but the ill conditioning or the well conditioning of a matrix is not determined by the 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 determinant of a matrix as might often be given to understand in the first course. So, here there are a couple of very good examples let A be a diagonal matrix of all halves the determinant of, uh, determinant of A is 1 over 2 to the power of n you can readily see the determinant of A goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. But the condition number of A is 1 for all p. So, the determinant and 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 condition number they do not have much of a relation. As another example let B be a n by n matrix consider an upper triangular matrix given by this you can readily see the determinant of B is 1, but the condition number of A infinite condition number is n and go that goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So, what does it mean? I can have matrices where the determinant goes to 0, but the condition number remains constant. I can have matrices where the determinant remains constant, but the condition number go, can go to infinity. So, this essentially tells you there is no intrinsic correlation between determinant and condition number. Even though we simply say a matrix must be non singular that means the determinant should not vanish for being able to solve A x is equal to B the appropriate way to describe the properties of solution one obtains from solving a linear equation. Um, one has to relate it to the condition number of a kappa. So, kappa is much more important than the determinant. Why kappa is more important? Now, I am going to give you another result that will force the importance of kappa the condition number within the context of solving linear systems. Let us suppose I want to solve a x is equal to b. Now, let us think of the possible way suppose you want to enter the number 1 over 3 and you 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 press the key 1 over 3. So, 1 over 3 is supposed to be stored in your machine, but 1 over 3 can never be stored correctly is 0 0.3333. What is the problem? 1 over 3 does not have a terminating decimal expansion. Only numbers that have terminating decimal expansion will be able to one one can hope to be able to represent them correctly. So, 1 over 3 1 over 7 these numbers once you store them to start with there is an error only rational numbers have terminating fraction irrational general real numbers may not have terminating fraction. When you do arithmetic you cannot confine yourself simply to rational arithmetic we are supposed to have real arithmetic. So, when you try to store a real number in a finite precision machine there is always error in representation that means you start with your left foot. So, when you think you are solving a x is equal to b you are not actually solving a x is equal to b you are solving a plus epsilon b y equal to b plus epsilon f. So, what does it mean epsilon b is the error in the matrix a epsilon f is the error in b there are two kinds of errors a may be obtained from experiment that that could be an inherent error in the experimental measurements a the numbers you store them storage error. So, epsilon b in this case I am simply I am not worrying about other errors errors that arise out of finite precision arithmetic. So, epsilon b b is a matrix epsilon is a small number. So, if I am thinking I am storing a you are not storing a you actually are storing a plus epsilon b you do not know what epsilon b, but you know that there is an error epsilon f is likewise an error. So, why is the system you are solve why is the solution of the system you are solving and you are pretending y is x okay, this is the game we all play that is the that, that's nature of the business. So, epsilon b and epsilon f are the perturbations of the matrix and the vectors respectively, um, but we are epsilon is greater than 0, but small. So, if if y is not equal to x there is an error 
I am now going to consider the relative error in y. So, y is a vector x is the true solution y minus x is the error vector in the solution. I am going to take the norm of the error divided by the norm of the true solution. So, what is that called? The term side is called the real uh, I am sorry relative error in the computed solution. I am not going to show the derivation. The derivation um, I generally do it in my class, but it, it, it will take us too much into the, the, the outside of this scope of these lectures. It can be shown that this relative error is bounded above by the product of condition number times epsilon divided f times b by a plus epsilon times f by b. Now, let us talk about b. What is b? b is the error matrix that corrupts a. a is the real matrix. So, this is the relative error in a. This is the relative error in b. Epsilons are the are the multiplying factors the same epsilon in here. So, the right hand side is the constant multiple of epsilon times the sum of the relative errors in the matrix and, and, and the right hand side. Now, the computer precision decides what b is. The computer precision decides what f is. Epsilon is decided by the smallest value the computer can store. So, all these factors are decided by the computer architecture. What, who depends uh, uh, so what else so your relative error is bounded by can be magnified by the product kappa a times the sum of the relative errors so if kappa is large your solution could be much more erroneous your kappa is small your solution could be much more precise therefore this is the reason why we call kappa the condition number it is a conditioning the matrix that relates to the quality of the solution obtained by any method that you use to solve ax is equal to b. Now, what is any method? I, so, what are the methods we know how to solve ax is equal to b? We know ton of methods. No matter what are the method you use, this you are you are bound by this inequality. So, if kappa is so if, if kappa is 10 to the power of 20 means what? Your relative error can blow up to 10 to the power of 20. If the relative error can go up by 20 to the power of 20, what does it mean? You have spent the money, but the result is, is not worth the paper written in. So, that is the importance of the notion of condition number. Why is this important? People in meteorology will say, hey, I am using a 3D war, I am using a 4D war, I am using this, I am using that. Yes, all those algorithms are very well understood, very well known, but you need to be cognizant to the fact that the solution that these algorithms output, the quality of it is decided by the nature and properties of the matrix that go into the computational process. So, you, since kappa a is greater than 1 errors in a and b are amplified. So, this is the keyword amplified the larger kappa more sensitive the system to the round of errors. Round of errors comes because of finite precision arithmetic. So, how so, so here is a beautiful idea now. I have a problem to solve, I have an algorithm to solve the problem, I have a computer architecture on which the algorithm is implemented. Here we talk about the effect of computer architecture the finite precision arithmetic could have on the quality of the solution that you are going to obtain. So, it is a beautiful combination of algorithms and architecture how they are melded together to give a solution whose quality can be quantified like this. With that we end the coverage of review of matrices I am going to suggest several exercises and I they are given in these problems there are about 12 problems in here and I, 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 I very strongly encourage students to use uh, pencil paper work do not go do not write a program you should know it first to be able to do with hand before you do with computers. So, all these problems are very simple and fundamental to understanding many of the concepts we covered. If you want proofs of many of the things that we have done in this lecture, you can refer to the three standard textbooks. These are my favorite one Golub and Van Lon, Mayer, Horn and Johnson. So, with this we conclude our coverage of overview of many results from matrices. 
you can see we have reviewed a ton of results. You may wonder do we need all of them? You will soon see we will use almost all of them in our analysis of algorithm inspiration. Thank you.